So tonight's talk is dedicated to all those nameless women who have gone before, who have woven the fabric of everyday world as necessity and as luxury. Their pursuit of complexity, elegance, skill, and beauty inspires the current generation of weavers. The 21st century weaver is inspired to create without regard to the amount of time it takes or whether it would be more sensible to purchase a, mis a machine made facsimile. Tonight's presentation will be divided into three, three learning areas of band weaving information. I'm going to be exploring the production, <clears throat> communicating with evil through pattern emojis, and researching historical uses of band weaving. I'm going to have to read from a script so that I can share the information and not repeat myself, nor forget about an important concept that I wanted to tell you about. My research begins with a family story. I took in the mangle board. I married an American Norwegian. P.S. I'll tell you more about this board before the evening is over. My last name became Amelie. I knew nothing about the family tree, the ancestral sagas, nor the family tales. I've been exploring, researching, and collecting information ever since. This photograph was shared in 2016 from Norway. It is a part of Jim's family album, which was taken before the 1900s. This is of Osman Anderson and his wife, Brigitte, Oli's daughter. Jim's immigrant grandmother is the daughter looking over the bearded Osmond. The family of Tunis, Gunhild, and three children plus an unmarried sister, Guinevere, packed in their mother's dowry trunk and left Norway from the farm in 1901 with a passage from Norway to Quebec by ship and then train ticket to Hanlon Town. They're, they were sponsored by, in part by the Gunhild's uncle. When they arrived in Quebec, the immigrants agent had had quite a day. He refused to record the family as Oli's sons and wanted them to pick another last name. The only writing they had was their mother's dowry family trunk. So the agent said he would use the writing on the trunk. The trunk's name is a farm name from West Telemark. He added a couple E's and a couple I's to make it look more English and recorded this new family as the Almelines. Now this trunk has slipped into a private collection over 50 years ago. The trunk's whereabouts is unknown. I would love to see the real thing just once. So if you've seen the trunk, please communicate with me. Immigrants would pack the trunk with things they needed for their new life in the new world, such as food for the journey. One staple in the trunk was a spinning wheel, packed in pieces that would be put together again to spin yarn in their new life. You see, fiber was woman's work. Woodwork and whittling was men's activities. In Norway, women did the housework, the farm work, and the animal tending. Men gathered, the, gathered because they were hunter-gatherers and they worked in the field. Their job was also to harvest wood for warmth and hunt and fish for food. The pocket knife was with them at all times. All women and girls learned to spin. Even when walking from farm to farm, they would spin and knit. Everyone made yarn. There was also a designated spinner on the farm. She was usually an unmarried sister. This is where we get the term spinster. There was no downtime for our forefathers nor foremothers' lives. 
Every waking mama was used to protect their lives against the evils of the world. Tonight, I am going to share with you my research into the use of the band, the technique of making a pattern rope, and the beliefs that are woven into the band. This, <clears throat> this is a Norwegian band, which tells a visual story to the person who knows how to read the emojis. This ribbon is used to protect. In this photograph, nope, let's go back. In this photograph, we see the mid band of the ribbon, which is produced by a pickup weave technique, and then two edge bands, usually complete, completed in pair of pair weaving technique. Well, where'd you learn to weave? I made potholders as a child. This was my first introduction to weaving. There are many ways of weaving and many looms to weave upon. This painting depicts a backstrap loom in use. The painting illustrates the backstrap loom and the setup to use it in all Nordic countries for band weaving. The weaver's left arm is moving the rigid heddle up and down to make a V called a shed. Then the weaver slides the string through the shed, tightens it on the salvages to make a fabric. This type of loom is usually tied to a bedpost in the small, warm living space of the home. Or outside, the loom would be tied to a tree. The band or rope could be woven on a floor loom, but that was usually full of clothing yardage. A weaver could use a cradle loom, which fits in the weaver's lap. A weaver could produce a band by setting up tablets or card weaving loom. And another loom found in the Eastern Norway is like what we know as an Inca loom. You sit on the side of it. And then there is a back strap that uses the bedpost and her body for the loom. A woman would weave a band by the light of the corner fire. And I theorize that the in the dark weaving is why the Scandinavians have bold color contrasts in their weaving and knitting. The woman was weaving after the sun went down. The weaving tool that I am showing right now is called a rigid heddle. In Norwegian, it is called a band grind. Hand carved in 1853, this heddle would have been a carved gift from a suitor. She would show her weaving skill by using the band grind to make him some hose bands to hold up his socks. When the heddle was not in use, it was hung on a hook on the wall. The next slide is a double slotted rigid heddle. The short slot, slot count is the number of pickup yarns that can be made on this heddle. This is called a spultagrind or a pattern heddle. The long slot and the holes are filled with the base color cotton or linen string, and the short slots are filled with colors or color to pick up for the pattern. Well, on with our story. In 2016, Jim and I, along with his sisters, went to Norway. The trip was organized by the Vesterheim Museum. We toured southern Norway and Iceland. This trip started in Oslo and we left 10 days later from Bergen to finish three days in Iceland. This 2020 map shows the reorganization of districts in Norway as of now. During our visit to West Telemark Museum, there were ladies demonstrating handcrafts in a typical farmhouse that was part of the museum. Note the light on the work table. There wasn't a lamp. The folk art they were producing was tatting, knitting, spraying, embroidery, 
And in the window seat was a weaver weaving on a small loom. The loom was a beautiful sculpture. A fellow traveler photographed me discovering the vertical loom and the band weaving. Price of handcrafts in Norway are breathtaking. Unlike the United States, the Norwegian handcraft price is calculated by the cost of the materials and the minimum wage time in hours invested in its production. Minimum wage in Norway right now starts at 22 US dollars per hour. Women's work is on par with all work done in Norway. During waffles, cream, and lingonberries, I tried to communicate my interests in knowing about this loom. I discovered that only five looms are made a year by Olaf Rue. He is a goat herder and carpenter. Also discovered that Elsa Versa had a weaving school and one of the folk art ladies said she might sell me one of her looms. I called her that evening and discovered the cost of the handmade loom. But she was unsure that she would sell one of her, her school looms. So I tucked away the phone number and went on with the tour. During a reflection of our tour around a table in Iceland, I had regrets for not pursuing the loom, but I knew it was too late. Then our tour guide said that she was returning to Norway with another group and she would bring the loom back to Decora, Iowa if I could arrange the sale. It was arranged with the help of many angels. I purchased the loom. The attribute of this Vinya loom is that it folds up and it carries like a large suitcase. The vertical loom arrived and sat on my dining room table. As I tried to figure out how to weave on it, I noticed that I was wearing out the shed by trying to make sense out of how to weave. The next part of my story is a story of perseverance. A book on Norwegian band weaving was ordered. I read it from cover to cover. It was full of wonderful information, but I still couldn't wrap my head around how to proceed on my loom. I broke down and Googled the artist or the author's name, Heather Tolgenrud. She lives in Montana, but she was giving a three-day workshop in Jacora at the Vesterheim Folk Art School. I called to register as a student, but the class was full. I was placed on a waiting list and waited on pins and needles until I learned that I was accepted into the class. I learned in the Vesterheim class about backstrap weaving. And on the third day, I brought in my vertical loom my mentor was intrigued and said that my banding was a start, but one had to figure out how to take the band weaving information learned in the class and how to translate it to my loom. I was hoping she would tell me. Well, I persevered, failed, took out weaving, wove badly, and made many, many, many mistakes. Next, the vertical loom when open, folds out. The loom sits 40 inches off the floor on my buffet and I stand to weave. Let's look at the anatomy of this loom. The top roller with its wooden ratchet holds the length of the band. It is the back bed post of the backstrap loom. The weaver dresses the length of the yarn on the top roller. This process is called warping the loom. The bottom roller is a take-up roll. It holds the woven band length. The two rollers work with each other to hold the warp taut, but not tight, taut enough to weave a band. The T angle about a third of the way down from the top houses the rigid heddle. We dress the loom with about 12 to 14 yards of warp. The key to the success of this loom is keeping 14 
to 16 inches between the rigid heddle and the finished band. Next. The warp is strung through the rigid heddle before it's guided onto the bottom roller. My loom has an 86 string ends to dress this Spoltegrund pattern heddle. Next. As in the painting of the backstrap loom, the V is formed by make, and makes a shed. This is the shed of my loom. The heddle is used either up or down to make a shed. The V is where the weaver places the filler. One weaves with a base colored string. The pickup yarn does not move because it's housed through the short slots on the Spalta Grand pattern heddle. I have embedded a video to show you the action of a loom. Up is toward me, down is away from me. Here's the action. Up, down, up, down. Notice that the base, the base color strings move, but the color that is the pickup yarn stays stationary. Next, because I am self-taught on this loom, I use tools that fit in my hand for the process. The top tool is a letter opener. I can pick up the yarn or hold them down with this tool to make the pattern. The middle tool is a six inch shuttle, which holds the cotton we weaving string. The weaver's term for this cotton string is called the will filler or weft. The bottom tool is a tongue depressor. I use this tool as a weaving stick. With this tool, I can take out, take one last look to check to make sure I'm following the pattern before I put the weft or filler into the shed. Taking out weaving is a harder process than weaving itself. And yes, I have taken out as much as three inches when I detect a mistake. Next, the average, the average of this, the advantage of this vertical loom is that I can walk away from the weaving. I do not have to unfasten myself from the loom when the doorbell rings or the potatoes are boiling over or the grandchildren are coming up the stairs. The tension of the warp is more consistent on these rollers than if it is around my waist in the back strap loom. I draw the band pattern on a piece of graph paper. The pattern is drawn to represent the pickup strings in the warp. I work from historical sources for my bands. Now there is no historical pattern encyclopedia from the past. They have been written down by studying historical bands. Authors have shared a wealth of pattern information gathered by research of old bands. In the past, the process of learning a pattern was from sight and repetition on a Norwegian farm. Identity was formed by weaving one pattern and everyone in that area practiced that one pattern. Therefore, there are farm patterns, there are valley patterns, there are community patterns, and there are district patterns. Certain bands were developed to communicate place. Next. Now I'm going to share my how it's made segment of the band on my loom. I am going to show you my step-by-step -step weaving. I'm going to slow down the movement so you can see what the artist sees. Right now, I'm working on the middle band first. I pick up the tool into the space just below the rigid heddle from right to left. Now I pick up string, march over one, pick up another string, march over one, pick up another string, march over one. Go back, please. Look, looking over my shoulder, you can see that I have a double thin pickup yarn rather than have one fat large yarn as a pickup strand. This trick allows 
for a flatter woven band. Okay. Gathering the pickup, I check for mistakes and then slide it down and put the weeding stick in. Next. The edge pattern is produced with six single yarn strands plus a cotton edge. The weaving technique is called pair weaving because one handles two yarns, one from a hole and one from a long, large slot at one time. On this slide, I am making an all gold line in the pattern. I do the left side, put it on the weaving stick. All the heddle action is done with my left hand. All the weaving action is done with my right hand. I am right-handed. Next, I finish the right edge of the band in the same sequence. Next, the band has a sequence of six actions before it calls for that gold line again. The edge band produced produces a Norwegian pattern. People from a distance can see the edge pattern and know it was produced in Telemark. The edge pattern is called a goat's hoof. Next, I slide the shuttle in on top of the weaving stick. Next, this is showing the removal of the weaving stick and the weaver then beats the last weft into the band and then delivers the filler cotton across the row that the weaver has just planned. Slide the shuttle through the shed. Next, pull and even out the salvage edge. Next, the band grows about an hour an inch. In a band pattern, red is the public side and the lighter side is toward the body. Historically, the color selection for the bands are an important way to communicate protection. Green is for renewal or promise. Gold is used for warmth, growth, hope, and wealth. Red is the color of life. It represents blood. Blue communicates thoughts of the water or the sea. White is daylight and the warmth of life. Black is night, death, and completes the cycle of life. Next. Here I am in my West Telemark costume called a Boonod. This costume was constructed in the late 1940s or early 1950s in Norway. I stand next to my West Telemark vertical band loom. Now we're going to transition into the realm of communication without the use of written word or the ability to read. These symbols were used to communicate. Scandinavian countries include Norway, Sweden, Denmark. There's also a historical band making presence in the Sami cultures. Scandinavian motifs were woven to be read and to protect. You see, emojis is a symbol that has meaning that is understood by others. Next. The circle we are going to communicate with, the first emoji we're going to communicate with is the circle. The circle stands for the sun. Its use, its use is a promise of spring is coming. The promise of light the life and warmth. Thinking of all the round Norwegian pins that you've seen with its many spoons and dangles. The round ring is never ending. The heart is the emoji that I'm going to show you in the use in many Norwegian folk art. Let's start looking at the heart. This is on the band and it's a symbol that is used over and over again. Next. The heart is the center of life, to love and be loved. A state of mind, emotional courage, not always reasonable. Head says one thing and a heart says another. Also in the culture of hunting of Old Norse, it tagged red with the heart because 
It was a practice to drink blood. Drinking blood gave courage and strength. Heart is positive. Heart is good feelings. I have been informing you about band weaving, yet the heart can be made an emoji on many other folk art pieces. From the collection of Vest Vesterheim's museum is a hand-carved band grin with the heart as one of the emojis for protection. This item is carved of wood and decorated with chip carving and pierced with the emojis. The heart is one of the emojis and the other emoji is the circle, which stands for the sun. From the museum artifacts, I've selected a double weave wall hanging to share with you. This hanging is red on one side and the design appears black on the back side. This is another example of the heart and its core as its core design. The trinket box on the left is incised with hot poking decoration. We call this craft wood burning. The Norwegians call this craft sweet decor. Look close at the knob on the four hearts that make the rhombus. From the collection, on the right image is a full-sized wooden kuba stool. This stool was carved out of a trunk of a tree. There is a heart design that is laid out within the carving of the acanthus. Can you see it? Yep, right in there. The back holds a heart pierced through the wood. One of the interesting notes of that a strip around one of these kuba stools or other wooden objects is called banding. Next, the silver heart can be found as a major design element on Norwegian brooches. This one is from Oslo. Oslo is considered the heart of the nation. It is where the king resides. This pin would be a neck button. It's considered an engagement pin. The length is celebrating the betrothal's virginity. The length also is a as celebrates the wealth of the man giving the gift. The heart is the symbol of the Virgin Mary. The heart shapes are repeated to make a circle, to make a waffle iron. The waffle is a historic dessert treat served with its long and berries and cream. Next. The heart can be found in this Telemark Rosemal trunk. The heart is nestled within the Acantus painting, much like the Cuba stool. This heart is filled with a netting to either keep the love in or not to let the love leave the trunk. The purse on the Norwegian national costume is called a side pocket. And this is a side pocket that has a heart emoji in its center. Like the preceding rose mauled heart, it is filled with netting or webbing. The embroidery pattern from the half glove from a citadel uh, hand is the next slide. As you can see, the heart emoji is placed on many folk art material and it communicates and protects. The cross is a, a another emoji, and the cross is management of opposites, positive and negative. A plus sign is a positive force. It's rational. In band weaving, the cross is a small element. The maker doesn't want to produce a yarn that is that can be snagged in the act of protect, protecting. But in the next slide, it is a rudder groove technique of weaving and the, art, the cross is very apparent. Strong magical power can communicate by the cross. And this was done pre-Christian beliefs. The cross symbolize, symbols give divine protection. 
The cross is used as protection against the plague and other epidemic diseases. The cross was often used to protect cattle, the milk, cheese, and butter. The next emoji is the St. Andrew's cross. Next, the St. Andrew's cross is a symbol that stands for humi humility. The hand down, handed down stories that St. Andrew's felt that he was unworthy to be crucified as Jesus. So he requested to be crucified on a tipped cross. This is a symbol that is an amulet that scares away demons, both spiritual and real. The double cross or children's cross is our next symbol. History has connected us to a, a hieroglyphics. This double cross was found in Egyptian hieroglyphics and used as a sign of medicine. The double cross protects food, especially cheese and cake. It protects the wearers against being double crossed. Also is called a children's cross because inside the diamond is four flecks that stand, oh, go back. The four flecks stand for seeds and fertility. This carries the concept of a future. This is a sign that protects generations to come. Next, the cross of Kringle. Its very protection is by confusing evil. The emoji unit is considered a pattern of XOX or OXO. Go ahead. On the left side, you can see the shape of the X and the shape of the O. A weaver has used the St. Andrew's cross next to a circle and then ends with the St. Andrew's cross. The slide on the right shows that the X and O can be done with light and dark. So I have red, white, red, or white, red, white. The emoji is a symbol of communicating fidelity. Valentines or love notes can end with a hug and a kiss, an X, an O, and an X. Next. The zigzag catches and holds on to evil. This pattern is mentioned in a will of a landowner during the 1700s. It tolls who got the protective belt among his heirs. A Norwegian's wife tale is when evil is chasing you, run in a zigzag. It will confuse evil and they won't ever catch you. Next, this is a graph pattern to weave a 13 pickup zigzag. The symbol uses six shuttle passes to obtain. The emoji will not let go of the evil that enters this symbol and blocks it from getting out. Next. Here's where I have woven a zigzag in an emoji and turned it upside down to make snarling teeth the sign in the band. I'm showing the front of the band and the back of the band. You can see how the reverse weaving happens. The next emoji I'm going to talk about is the altabard rose. Next. It's carved out of uh, uh, it's carved out of a circle, which is the sun. This rose expresses happiness in marriage, a promise that spring will come. It provides and gives fertility, and the e emoji also stands for abundance. The five-pointed rose can also have sharp points, not to be confused with the snowflake. The emoji is a, communicates a blessing to you, and it is a symbol of the resurrection. Next. The next two emojis that we're going to be looking at are the triangle and the rhombus. I've used the term rhombus. It is defined as a four-sided shape that opposite sides are of equal length. So it can be a square or a diamond. 
Next. The rhombus stands for the earth, the, the field, or the womb. The flex inside is the next generation of children or seeds to be planted, take root, and harvest. It is It communicates the hope of a fruitful life. A square rhombus is the earth lying within its four corners. Next is the triangle. Tipped up or pointed up, it's masculine and it means power and fire. If the triangle is pointing down, it means water falling and the uterus. An hourglass stands for the passage of time. This is also a symbol of creativity. It also stands for when male and female meet. This is a close-up of a weaving knife. The triangular emoji was used as a surface design. Next, carved by a man for a woman to be used in weaving. This dates as 1943. This is an example of triangular chip carving surface design. Next. The endless sign or the not design can be found to communicate to evil by blocking its entrance. It stops bad things from getting to the wearer. Next. This is my, the next band is my endless band. This was inspired by a band fragment found in the Oslo burial ship that was carbon dated to around 850 AD. The next is the Kringla cookie. This is made into the shape of an infinity sign or not. Its historic shape was again for protection. Next, the checkerboard, we'll go on. The checkerboard emoji starts a band and ends a band if you're weaving from Telemark. The emoji holds nightmares so they don't become true. Mares were supernatural beings. They were demonic spirits of, from olden times. They hold angst and fear. The checkerboard was also the playing field of life, a battle between light and dark. Next. The travelers, the traveling Vikings brought back the meaning of the alpha. Next. The emoji was used to protect leadership. It marked a person who was going to lead the way. Next, the pattern for the 13 band pickup is on the left and it has 10 passes with the shuttle. And on the right is the woven alpha. Next, Thor with his use of lightning and wind has another emoji, but this symbol meaning was overpowered as it was selected to stand for an idea of hate during the 20th century. Other emojis, such as the one pictured here, has their meaning lost in the fog of time. You may now be aware of some of the amulets and emojis that shield one from life. It is very important to note that the passage of the emoji protects, protection is intensified by giving the object to the next generation. Therefore, one should ask if the Norwegian brooch is inherited because it would have more protection coming to the wearer if it was a gift from, pa from past generations. I'm hoping you're laughing at this one. The Norwegian runes um, we're still used to invent new concepts new, and new emojis for our times. The seamless communication of a was named after a man who loved blueberries, Harold Bluetooth. We have been talking about the meaning of color, and I shared with you my research of emoji patterns to communicate 
we're now going to need to talk about the protection of numbers. In Norwegian brooches, this is a Norwegian brooch from the 1930s that was made by Marcus Hammer. He was making his jewelry in Bergen. Look closely for the number three. Yep, right in there. And he also uses fours, and you can see the St. Andrew's cross and the X with the fours. When using fours of something, the protection can be enhanced by its multipliers. And when using threes, it can be enhanced by its multipliers. So the number 12 is the least common denominator. This number was powerful even before Christianity and the 12 disciples came into Norway. Next. Three in Viking times stood for the past, the present, and the future. This site near Starvanger commemorates the unity of Norway. It is three swords, but did you realize they're 33 feet high? After the 1100s, the power of three was transferred to the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, quiz time. How many belly goat gruffs passed over the bridge to the summer pasture? The answer, three. Three is a powerful number to ward off evil. Next. The breastplate found in the Vestheim collection is from the Dunmore National Co uh, Costume. This was constructed in the 1800s, 1800 to 1850. The fiber emoji hearts and flowers is an example of the power of four. The number four power comes from mythology. The gods traveled water and the sea and notice that sometimes the sky wouldn't stay up. It became foggy and the stars were blocked and therefore the seamen could not navigate. So the, thought, the saga tells of God's decision to make four dwarfs to hold up the sky. These dwarves name north, south, east, and west. This is also where we get the concept of four corners of the world. Next. Here is my sending band. Historically, groups of farms would get together to help each other when hosting company for christenings, weddings, funerals, and other parties. Members of the farm group would send a donation of food for the guests at the gathering that could last for days. The sending ban was an ownership item that would mark the containers so that one would get their basket or container back. Look at the number threes and the number fours on this one. As mentioned, the least common denominator of three and four is 12. This number is why I make my band 120 inches. It is the number that is over three meters that has a protection significance. Next. This image is a close-up of my Bunat apron band. It was woven before 1949. Its delicate band is my weaving goal in my banding. The emojis one spots, well, you can see the Aldebar rose. You can find the uh, rhombus of fertility and the St. Andrew's cross. There's hearts, there's an alpha. And then there's an M or a W that I call placeholders because I haven't yet found their meaning. I'm this close to replicating the width of the band with my weaving. Next, folk art is usually left anonymous, but some of the Westerheim Museum bands have been woven with dates and some with initials. These initials may be for the person who is receiving the band as a gift, or time. some other times the initials stand for the person who has woven the band on the loom. Next, 
The next part of this evening's presentation, we're going to see images of historical bands at work. Historically, bands were used as ribbons for hair ties. The lady's hair was always bound. Free flowing hair was only allowed on the bride's wedding day. The scout on the left, the scout or hat on the left is a, has historic band ties coming out of the back. This is part of the Hollandale costume. Next. My telemark headpiece is called a circlet. The circle represents the set of braids that have been cut off. The filler woven, the filler that is the woven bands have been wrapped around is two unspun linen fiber rings. Next. From the Digital Museum, we have found examples of the use of banding. This young wife has swaddled her baby on a board and then is carrying the bundle with a looped band around her neck. She's taking her child to work with her on this day. The next photograph is a farm wife that is carrying a container full of porridge to the neighbor's neighboring farm. She has tied her container up with a cloth and a sending band to tag the container for its return when empty. The next slide is a bride using a shortening band. The band was tied around her hips of the national costume and was pulled up and fluffed over it. She could now walk in the mud without getting her outer garment muddy. The undergarment would be a thing that got muddy as she traveled to the photographer to document her wedding day. Bands were used for swaddling babes also. Next. Straight legs were the goal of each mother. The lack of vitamin D from the sun was missing during the winter and the child might develop rickets. The practice of swaddling was used to help curb the effect of this disease. Note the band wrapping across the shoulders are the St. Andrew's cross. And then the lower part is wrapped so that the diaper could be changed. There is a great historic black and white movie in the Digital Museum that shows this process of swaddling a babe that you need to look at. There's also paintings in the museum that show uh, the bands holding animal skins close to the man as he crossed over the winter mountain passes. Next. This woman is transporting a babe with a band sling, but the blanket on, wrapped on the babe is made of sewing together mini bands from past generations. This was done for protection. This is a photograph that depicts the act of taking the child to a baptism and to record the birth with the church. Next. The apron band is a common use of banding. The band was wrapped around the waist twice before it was tied in a knot and fell down the front of her national costume called a bunad. The right image shows the, tab the tablet woven wide waistband with the thin apron band falling down the front of the bunad that was under it. A girl received her bunad on her confirmation day. This was after the national independence and after 1903. This bunad was handmade by her family and would be worn the rest of her life. So it had great seams and a lot of gathers. Next. I use one of my bands to complete my bunad jacket. This jacket was a ready-made boiled wool construction, but the band was the bands were historically placed to protect the pulse. So around the wrist and around the neck 
and across the heart, the bands were added to protect. The, the jacket does not need bands around the waist because the apron band is protecting that part of your life. Another use of bands is called suspenders. The suspenders were used for both men and women in different districts. Some dis districts, the costumes are a jumper like mine, and other districts, the buna is a skirt and a vest and jacket, or breeches, a vest and jacket. The skirt or breeches would be held up with the suspenders. Next. These are hose bands. They, were made, they can be made with finger weaving, band weaving, tablet weaving bands. These bands were to hold up the knee high socks. So they would then be tied and then tucked under the knee high breeches. The end would peek out to make a color around the knee. Visual communication was the job for banding. Different colored tassels, different lengths of tassels, different fringes told where the wearer came from without speaking to the individual. One could gather visual information from color and the symbols and the tassels. Next. Here are a number of historic finishing ends on historic bands. These are from different farms, different communities, different fjords, different valleys, and different regions. Next. In 2020, I added another national costume accessory to, my, uh, to attend my granddaughter's christening. A mask was required for the 10 people who could attend the baptism. I wore the Almeline Bunad mask with my Bunad to this joyous event. I've been talking about the rich history of banding in Norway, but there are traditions found in Denmark, Sweden, and the Sami cultures, as well as Iceland and Finland. Next. In review, fiber is historically woman's work. Woodwork and wood decoration was practiced by men while hunting, fishing, and finding food and warmth for his family. He would practice this also during the long hours of the winter's nights. This is a courting picture. The action, it starts the negotiation of marriage. Next, some men made rigid heddle looms to show his woodcrafting skills as a courting gift to win over the girl and starting the process of finding a wife. And in return, the wife candidate would weave something on the loom to show her skills. The final piece uh, that, of wood that the man would make is a, to, is a courting activity would be to carve a mango board. This would be used with a dowel stick to flat, wet, and starched fiber. The man would prop the board against a door stop, and if she took it in, the act was an agreement that said, yes, I'll marry you and I'll do your laundry. My ending image for this evening is from the Omeline studio. This multimedia piece is called The Song of the Loom. My goal this evening was to add to your knowledge base about band weaving and to have you become aware of emoji, meaning no matter what folk art it was produced upon. I would like you to go and look at your Norwegian sweater if you can now read the protection symbols that are being used to shield you from the world's evil. Finally, I hope you have become aware that using emojis did not originate on our computer communication nor social media of the 21st century. Thank you for attending and allowing me to share my research about being Norwegian. Oh, Kathleen, this was just a delightful presentation. Thank you so much. So much wonderful knowledge to, to share and such a lovely time together.
there have been a lot of folks who have been asking about printed copies of symbols and the meanings. And Loran, I'm going to let you answer that one because I know the museum has a couple resources available. Sure. I believe Andrew is going to share a PDF with all of you of some basic symbol information. And we hope you'll check the Vesterheim website uh, not too far in the future. We plan to do a virtual exhibition that will be available on our website that will tell a little bit about some of the other symbols used on textiles and folk art for protection and fertility and uh, good luck. So watch for that in the future. Kathleen, mm -hmm. uh, we've also had a lot of questions about resources. Could you mention a few of your favorite resources? Well, my resources started by coming from the uh, Heather's book on Norwegian pickup. She has a wonderful resource list. I have searched around and found my favorite resources in yarn come from the Vestuga, uh, the Vestuga Weaving School in Maryland. It's a Swedish yarn. And what's neat about that, weavers, is you can buy a jar of yarn and you get one kind of yarn and it shows you all the colors it comes in. And so that's a wonderful source. There are other sources and I've written other books. Don't be afraid of finding books in Norwegian because you can use your app to get a translation and read what they're saying. And that's where I got a lot of my things. Wonderful. Uh, we probably only have a couple a couple minutes for questions here, because I know that we're scheduled to end at eight and we're already hitting that moment. But a couple questions about materials. What fiber do you use to weave your bands? And then Chris is asking, what dyes were traditionally used in the times before 1850? Okay, I use cotton. Um, I use you can also use linen, and that's my next experiment, is linen, and I use wool. Um, the natural dyes were something that were used a lot. And if you go to Vesterheim and look at their collection, you will see a lot of different dyes that have wimped out with sunlight. So there are a lot of dyeing that went on. Yep, excellent. And several of our listeners tonight have noticed connections between the bands that you were showing and other traditions around the world, including Latvia. And so we have a question about uh, another similarity, which is some similarities between some of the band patterns you've showed and uh, runic symbols. Have you noticed other uh, connection between symbols and weaving and earlier symbols like runes? Yes, they're all over. We have just, just reading wasn't the main source of communication. It was the runes and it was, and that then turned into these, using them over and over again. Um, it was just a different way of communicating. And it was worldly because the Vikings traveled quite a ways around the world. Absolutely. Lauren, I think we have time for about one more question. Is there one more that you've got your eye on? Sorry, we've got uh, just one more clarification maybe is about the materials. Uh, what are the fibers that you're using in your bands? I'm using cotton string, but prior to having cotton in Norway, they would have been using linen. Okay. So you can use linen as well. It's not as pliable, but it's still weavable. And then the Norwegian sheep would make wool, grow wool <laughs> to be spun. 